Okay, good morning, Psychology 101 students. I hope that this is finding you well uh, and that you're able to take care of yourselves. Uh, let's go over, before we get into chapter nine today, let's go over a couple things. There is out on Canvas under um, the schedules, the weekly schedules under files, um, a um, kind of a list uh, schedule out for everything that we have coming up for the rest of the semester. And I think pretty much what we have um, are weekly lectures and then the discussion questions that are due every Friday at 2 p.m. And so for those, uh, if any of you are having difficulty with Canvas um, and can't e either get into the discussion questions or can't get them to um, accept, you can always go ahead and email those to me either through Canvas or, in or to my um, email account. If you do that, um, you also need to be contacting IT and letting them know that you're having difficulty with Canvas. And what you will get is a help desk number, and you'll need to include that number in any emails that you send to me with your uh, discussion question answers if you can't get them to load into Canvas. Without that IT number, um, I will not be able to give you any points. Uh, so this week we are doing um, chapter nine memory and the discussion questions. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and move those out this week only. Let's make those due on Monday. Um, let's make them due Monday by 3 p.m. Let me make a note here so that I know to do that. And then it looks like, like I said, the rest of the time we'll be doing um, video lectures and then the discussion questions final will be online on Canvas at the end of the semester. I have uh, your addiction, uh, breaking and addiction assignments were due last Friday. I will have those graded and those grades posted uh, by the end of the weekend. And I think other than that, let's go ahead and get started with chapter nine. Memory, give me just a second. I'm going to try and share. Hopefully this works. PowerPoint. Okay, here we go. All right, so memory... Okay, memory. Um, and so we're not only gonna be talking about the ways which we store memory, but we're gonna be talking about retrieving memories because it really does us no good to um, have information stored or memory stored if we're not able to get those memories back out. All right, so memory simply is that ability to uh, store and retrieve information. And the, one of the biggest components of memory is attention. Um, because memory starts with um, what's going on around us. Our senses are taking in so much information and most of the time we aren't even paying attention to a lot of that because it would just be overload. And that a lot of things never even get into memory just simply because we weren't paying attention to them. And before we move on, I just wanna hit a few spots in the brain um, that are connected to memory. The auditory, cortex uh, deals with memories that are related to hearing, um, just as the visual cortex, and I know it's not on this um, particular slide, but the visual cortex uh, deals with memories um, that come in uh, through our, our eye, eyesight, eyes, through vision. When we talk about the hippocampus, um, hippocampus is responsible for long-term memory and memory storage. And then the amygdala. So the amygdala Amygdala plays an important role in um, a memories that are tied to emotions, so emotional memories. And this is where we can see individuals uh, who are suffering from PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, they are having issues. Uh, one of the symptoms of PTSD is flashbacks. And these flashbacks are memories of the traumatic event that the person um, uh, they tend to overreact to these memories because they're so uh, strongly tied to the emotions of what was going on. And that is in part uh, because the amygdala was activated or overactivated uh, during the trauma. And so people um, with that are suffering from PTSD have problems getting rid of these traumatic memories um, because of their uh, because their emotional memories. Okay, so we are going to talk about the three stages of memory. Uh, and one of the things that uh, during these stages, not only can memory be um, saved and stored, but it can be uh, lost um, or misplaced during this time. 
All right, so we're back to sensory memory. Once again, this is uh, all the information that our senses are taking in um, from the environment around us. It can be like kind of sort of, if you think of fleeting impressions. Um, so uh, iconic memories are, if you've ever had your photograph taken and the person used a flash, and you could still kind of see the, the flash in your, your eyesight after the picture was taken, that's uh, an example of um, a sensory memory um, that's related to iconic memories in your vision. Um, echoic memories would be related to hearing. Um, something like that would be if you were at the museum and someone dropped their keys or their phone, the echo of that sound in your ear for just a couple seconds uh, is an example of echoic memories. Working memory. And we're gonna talk a little bit about Badley's model of working memory. And this is, uh, working memory is basically, we're taking the information that we um, are trying to remember uh, and we're trying to manipulate it or use it. And this is where attention becomes extremely important. So I'm gonna give an example of working memory without writing anything down. I would like you in your head to add the following two numbers together. 1,874 plus 3,326. The answer is 5,200. And this is an, an example of short-term memory because we're having to hold two pieces of information and then try and manipulate them, uh, in this case, adding them together to get the correct total. And one of the things that we often do to uh, keep information in our short-term memory until either we can transfer it to long-term memory or at least get it written down is rehearsal. And an example, if you've ever been out and someone's given you their phone number and you didn't have any, you know, you didn't have your phone and you didn't have a pen right with you, you might repeat it to yourself over and over again until you get somewhere where you can write it down. That would be an example of rehearsal. Okay, so we're gonna be doing some um, activities together. Uh, throughout this lecture. Uh, this one, I'm going to read off a list of numbers. And what I'd like you to do, uh, I'm going to read the list of numbers. I'd like you to wait until I'm finished reading them and I'll say go. I want you to write down in order as many of the numbers that you can remember. Four, nine, zero, two, eight, four, one, two, five, four, three, seven. Go. Okay, so how many did you get? This test is known as the digit span test, and this is, uh, again, testing short-term memory. What we typically find in adults is adults can hold between five and nine items in a series. Um, and the average tends to be about seven. So you can take a look and see how many you were able to find or how many you were able to remember. Okay, the next thing we're gonna talk about is long-term memory. So long-term memory basically are memories that last for more than just a few minutes. Research has shown us that our capacity for long-term memory is pretty endless. Okay, we're going to do, um, <laughs> let's do, we're going to do three word list. The first one I'm going to read to you, uh, I'm going to read you a list of words. And after I finish reading this, Lord, I'm going to read the list, I'm going to say go. I want you to write down um, as many words as you can remember. And it doesn't matter, uh, it doesn't matter what order, just whatever you remember, write it down. So I'm going to read this list, say go, and you're gonna write down as many words as you remember. Sky, plate, tree, store, car, paper, glove, bread, dice, skate, Cat, desk, witch, candy, eggs, go. Okay. All 
right, the second list that I'm going to read to you, I'm going to read you a list again of 15 words. This time after I finish reading the list, there's going to be a 30 second delay before you can start writing anything down. Um, and this time you have to uh, try and remember the words in the order that I read them to you. So I'm gonna read the list. I'm gonna put my phone on for a 30 second delay. Then when I say go, you're going to write down as much as you can remember in the order that I read them. Nine, swap, sell, ring, table, apple, lamp, horse, color, baby, spoon, dirt, hold, bottle, sun. Write down as many as you remember in the order that I uh, set them to you. Okay, for the last list, again, I'm going to read uh, another list of 15 words. This time there will not be a delay after I read them. So I'm going to read the list, say go. I want you to write down as many words uh, that you can remember in order. So again, this one is remembering the list in order. Snow, candle, school, flower, pen, chair, water, sugar, shade, board, dog, cheese, fire, bed, camp, go. Okay, um, so this is designed uh, first to show the difference between uh, I think it's easier when uh, someone gives you a list of words that if you can remember them in however you remember them, they don't have to be in order, one that makes it easier. And then it shows the difference between something that's known as the primacy effect and the recency effect in memory. So the primacy effect is uh, has to do with, um, uh, so the primacy and recency effect um, deal with, we tend to remember um, items in a series uh, that are at the beginning of the, uh, the series and at the end of the series. And the primacy effect is our ability to remember those uh, first few items or the uh, earliest items better. So on that last one, um, when I started with snow, candle, school, you might have been doing snow, snow, candle, snow, candle, snow, candle, school, snow, candle, school. So you're doing a little bit of rehearsing while you're trying to remember those. Um, and that can be why we tend to remember the uh, beginning of a list better. And the recency effect deals with our ability to recall the items at the end of a, a list or a series better uh, because they were the most recent things that we heard. Where we have difficulty tends to be in the middle of a, a list or a series of information. Okay. All right, um, so I am going to very briefly here in a, in a moment, I'm going to flip the slide and you're going to see a series of letters. What I would like for you to do is I'm going to leave that slide up for about three to five seconds. Um, and what I'm going to do, uh, what I'd like you to do is uh, take a look at that series of letters. Try and remember as many as you can uh, in the order that they appear. Okay, so I'm going to flip it. Leave the slide up for a few minutes. Try and remember as many as you can. Uh, when I say go, write down as many of those letters in order that you remember.
Go. Okay, uh, so we're going to take a look at how well you did at remembering them. Um, you know, did you remember more from the beginning, the end? Did you use any techniques to try and remember that information? And one of the techniques that uh, we tend to do when we have a series of uh, especially letters or even numbers, um, but we try to chunk the information into smaller pieces. So if you look at this, um, what I might pick out here, so there's the A, but LOL, uh, which we often put into texting. If you're familiar with colleges or sports, uh, college sports, LSU, there's FBI and then I see Hulu. And that would be uh, an ideal or an example of chunking that longer list of letters into smaller, uh, smaller, more manageable pieces that have some sort of meaning that makes it easier to remember. Okay, so how is it that we actually go from moving, uh, getting our memory into long-term memory? Well, again, you know, we're starting with encoding and that basically is the process of taking in um, everything that's going on around us in our environment and that's through our senses. And we end up um, converting that raw sensory information into uh, something, a way that we're able to communicate. And that to, tends to be with language. And so from there, we consolidate our short-term memory into long-term memory. And that's basically we're moving short-term memories over into long-term memories. And one of the um, important factors or uh, a key to getting information into long-term memory. Again, um, we have to have, have to have attention to actually um, get it into our short-term memory. We had to notice it. And then to get it over into our long-term memory for consolidation, sleep is very important. Um, quite a bit of consolidation from short-term memory to, to long-term memory happens while we're sleeping. And then finally, uh, we have to be able to get those memories out of long-term memory and be able to pull them back into our, basically just think of our current memory, our current thoughts, and be able to remember it, be able to uh, use that information for some reason. And this slide is a uh, brief couple uh, infographs to show you what we've been talking about over the last few slides. The next thing we're going to talk about is declarative and non-declarative memory. When we talk about declarative memory, these are our explicit memories. These are memories that we um, were explicitly aware um, that we are ac uh, accessing them. So if I were to say to you, Columbus sailed the ocean blue in, if you fill in the, the date or the year for that, that is an idea of an explicit memory. They're usually based around facts. And we also have what is known as episodic memory, and these are basically the explicit memories of our own life. When you uh, pull up a memory, it would be the who was there, when did it happen, um, if you know what, you know where it happened. Um, because that information can be a little less important than the actual uh, what happened during the memory, that information can be uh, easily forgotten if it's not important. And then semantic memory. This is basic knowledge memory days of the week, um, being able to count one to 100, months of the year, those kind of things. Uh, and that kind of information or those kind of memories are very rarely lost. Okay, when we talk about implicit memory, so this is memory that comes uh, from skill or habit. So if you think about if you're able to drive a stick shift, if you uh, can hit a baseball, if you dance, if you play an instrument, those kind of things, excuse me, those kind of things. Um, and we typically demonstrate this sort of memory through performance um, rather than by conscious recollection. And then you'll see uh, declarative and non-declarative memory broken out. Okay, let's talk about forgetting. Forgetting um, basically is uh, our inability to be able to retrieve our memories from long-term memory. And we're gonna talk about a couple processes. The first one is fade. And this is when our memories just gradually fade from, uh, or gradually disappear from our, our mind until they are completely lost. 
and then retrieval issues, this would be basically we have trouble accessing the information. If you've ever uh, you know, been studying for a test, the day of the test comes, you sit down, you know, you know the information, you sit down, you get to some questions and you draw a complete blank. That's an issue with retrieval. Um, the memory is still there, but you just can't go, or the information, the memory is still there, but you just can't go and find it. Okay, so we're gonna talk about the vulnerability of memory interference. Uh, interference is when one, one memory starts to interfere with another. And we talk about it, uh, proactive or retroactive interference. Uh, proactive interference is when new information um, interferes with recalling old, old information. I'm sorry, proactive is old information prevents us from, from uh, recalling new information. So if you think about all the passwords that you have, uh, when you have to change maybe your password to get into Avila, what you might do the next time that you go and log in, um, instead of remembering the new password, you automatically type in the old password. And then you're like, crap, the only thing I can remember is the old password, so you have to go and look up the new information. Uh, and then it's just the, the opposite for retroactive um, interference. It's when new information gets in the way um, of recalling old information. And where we can see this play out both ways is when we're learning language. Uh, as we're starting to learn a new language, um, we have a hard time learning the new language because all we can remember uh, is our um, previous language. And then the vice versa happens. As we start to get to learn um, the new language better, we may have a hard time recalling certain words from the previous language. All right, memory being a susceptible to distortion. So let's talk about how that happens. Uh, first, we'll start with memory trace. So memory trace is the physical record of the memory. Um, and what happens every time we pull a memory out of long-term memory, every time we pull it up, it's subject to change. So um, if, as we're pulling that original memory up, if we make any changes to that memory, when we go back and restore that memory, what we're storing is the revision instead of the original memory. And mis misinformation effect can kind of help explain that. So our brain is, and our memory is, uh, susceptible to filling in details. And that's because our brain doesn't like um, not having all the information. So if we have a, a moment in a memory that's blank, our brain will try and fill that in and it might take its best guess. It might just think logically what probably happened during there and try and fill it in with that. Um, something else that can happen is uh, words can prime someone to remember something a certain way and that's why detectives or forensic psychologists that are interviewing um, individuals or witnesses are careful about the words they use and the way that they ask questions because they don't want to lead someone um, into remembering something inaccurate. Because what can happen is when we pull that memory back up, particularly if we're with someone that we think is an authority figure or a friend or they're a trusted person, we can incorporate uh, information that they're giving us into a memory. So let's say you and a friend are sitting around talking about something that happened and you're telling, you know, your memory of it, and your friend's like, what? No, no, no. It was, don't you remember this happened? And you're like, oh, yeah, I remember that. Um, and so you'll, you may start to incorporate that information into your memory. And when you go to save that memory back into long-term memory, you've saved those new additions. Flashbulb memories. Um, flashbulb memories are these very vivid, detailed memories around very momentous times in our life. They can be um, things that happen out in the world. 9-11, um, now the coronavirus. Um, they can be tied to personal events, graduation, 21st birthday, uh, when you get married, when you have children. Um, and because these are, are so momentous and they're usually, again, tied to um, ex you know, pretty extreme emotions, happy or otherwise, uh, we tend to think that we're going to recall those memories um, better. And what research actually shows us is um, that we don't, no, we're no better at um, recalling uh, the, those memories than we are other memories. And one of the things we tend to find is that these memories can be susceptible to change. And one of the reasons is 
because it's such a momentous memory, we often go back and revisit it over and over and we may talk about it with uh, more people and we might start to add new and different details to the memory. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put links out to a couple of these. Uh, the first one is no longer working to check it off because of copyright issues, but I am going to put links for the car crash memory experiment and the monkey illusion business for you to watch. And both of these really demonstrate um, why attention is so important in memory and how um, the words that we use can actually lead someone to um, make changes to their memory um, or, or to kind of go along with what's being suggested. Okay, so I'm going to ask you guys, and do not, if you don't mind, don't pull out a penny, don't look up a penny on the internet. Uh, again, this is going to be um, designed to help you see how important attention is and to demonstrate how even something uh, as common as a penny that we've seen thousands of times, we really don't pay attention to it. So I'm going to ask you, what color is a penny? Whose face is on the penny? Which way is the person facing? Above the person's head, what does it say? Where are the words one cent located? On the heads or tail side? Top or bottom, left or right? Where is the ear of the penny found? On the heads or tail side? What does it say at the top of the penny on the tail side? Where's the word liberty located? Heads or tail side? Top, bottom, left side or right side? All right, the next slide that I'm going to show you is um, several pictures of a penny and I would like you to Choose which one is correct. And it was penny A. So I'm going to go back. There's penny A. There's penny A and there is all of the, the information that I was asking earlier about the penny. And this is a pretty easy uh, demonstration to show uh, how we really don't pay that much attention to things that we that aren't important to you know our daily life whether or not we know where the year of the penny is written usually is on a, a life or death um, sort of question okay. another vulnerability another vulnerability of memory is amnesia and we have two types so when we talk about retrograde amnesia, uh, when this happens, the individual loses their memory um, of everything prior to the event. And typically this type of memory is trauma-induced. So it might be something from a car crash, um, a traumatic brain injury, something like that. And then when we talk about anterior grade amnesia, uh, this is from the moment um, the person loses their memory, they um, are unable to form new memories. Okay, so when we forget, uh, and it's due to retrieval, so we're having issues of, the information is there, the memory hasn't been lost, but it's due to retrieval issues. Um, how do we help someone actually try and remember that information? So these are the things that we're going to talk briefly about. The first one, uh, cue to recall, and all of you are familiar with this. Uh, think of multiple choice tests. This is something where you get the question and the answer is provided. So the hope is that um, by having the actual answer there, that might actually um, help you recall what the answer to the question is. The next one, priming. So when we talk about priming, um, so this is, being exposed to a stimulus, such as a word. Uh, it can be a word or an image, um, and it influences how we respond to subsequent related stimuluses. 
And an example of this would be, um, so someone that sees the word doctor uh, will faster recognize the word nurse than they would the word banana or any other word that's unrelated to uh, medicine. Uh, because the two concepts, doctor and nurse, are, are closely, uh, closely related, they're closely associated. Uh, another example would be maybe exposing someone to the word yellow, uh, and they're going to better or faster respond to uh, the word banana, because again, we, associate, we make associations between um, bananas being yellow. Right, spreading activation. Um, we tend to base our knowledge on, uh, of the world based on our own experiences. Uh, so spreading activation uh, is kind of how the brain runs through, um, runs through our memories um, and the information that we have in order to grab a specific piece of information. So it might, you know, something that you might think of um, when you're sitting there thinking about one thing, uh, it might suddenly make you think of something else. And I am not going to ask any questions on the test about spreading activation or semantic webs. I just want you to have just a brief um, bit of information, excuse me, a brief bit of information about, about these. <clears throat> excuse me, uh, so semantic webs. Uh, so semantic webs have to do with words and language and, um, and how they are incorporated into our memories. So this is where thinking of one word um, oftentimes triggers us thinking of another word. And a very, very simple way to demonstrate that is if um, we go through a free association exercise. And if I were to say maybe the word rain, and so if I said, Rain, rain, clouds, fluffy, cotton, fabric, dresses. So you can kind of see how, um, how my thought process is going. Um, and then the way that they have it here is if you were to bring up the word uh, wolf, uh, wolf might make you think of dog, or, uh, and then dog might lead you down another path of maybe animals or puppy or cats. Um, and so it's just kind of, what path your, your mind or your brain takes to find other words associated with the original word, um, and maybe, you know, with the original memory. So when we talk about context-dependent retrieval, uh, when you guys come into class at the beginning of the semester and you pick your seats, that kind of tends to be where you sit throughout the rest of the semester, and this is where you're learning all of the information. And so when it comes to test day, you're more comfortable staying in the, the same seat that you've been in all semester instead of you know, having to move to either a, a different part of the room or a new room. And this is the idea that we tend to uh, be better able to recall information um, when we're in the same environment that we learned it. So any of you that are going to have to do any sort of exams for for licensure or uh, if you want to go to graduate school or something like that um, and where you're going to be studying you know many months before the exam and you just walk into this cold room with 100 to 300 other people and take the test one of the things that um, we recommend is that you actually study in many different environments you study at home you study at the library you go to the coffee shop um, and what this does is it gets you used to not getting too comfortable in one type of environment. It gets you used to there being some sort of distractions around. So when you walk into an environment that you um, are unfamiliar with, uh, you, um, you have many different experiences to pull upon um, from your memory from, from when you were trying to learn the information. Okay, so I want to talk about, oh, let's see. And I have, oh, before we do that, so I'm just gonna go back. I wanna do a quick activity with you. Uh, so what I'm going to do for this activity, I'm going to read a list of 20 words. And what I'd like you to do is try and remember as many of the words as possible. You do not have to remember them in order and there's going to be no delay. So what I'm going to do is read the list. I'm going to say go. Uh, you can write them down um, however you remember them. They do not have to be in the order that I read them to you. 
Awake, bedroom, lazy, midnight, bed, rest, moon, pillow, slumber, night, dreams, snore, pajamas, tired, nightmare, blanket, yawn, exhausted, darkness, nap. Go. So first, how many words did you get? And then um, how many of you remembered the word slumber? How many remembered the word tired? How many remembered the word nap? And how many of you remembered the word sleep? Okay. Sleep was the only um, word on the list that I did not say. And so I'll go through it really quick. Awake, bedroom, lazy, midnight, bed, rest, moon, pillow, slumber, night, dreams, snore, pajamas, tired, nightmare, blanket, yawn, exhausted, darkness, nap. And what this is a very simple exercise to try and show um, by using words that are associated with sleep. I was trying to prime you um, to inaccurately recall that word as something that you remembered hearing. Okay. And then um, I think this is the last slide. Finally, we're just talking, again, other ways to improve memory. Some of these we've talking about, um, anomic devices. Um, trunking, that's taking a long list of um, information and breaking it into smaller parts. Method of loci. Uh, this has also been called, um, I think, the brain palace, but this is where we kind of create a map within our brain and we associate what we're trying to remember with um, the map that we're creating. And that is it. Uh, so the PowerPoints are up on Canvas. The study guide is also on Canvas. Uh, the discussion questions are going to be due Monday by 3 p.m. If you have any issues or questions, please feel free to call me. Have a great rest of your week, and I'll see you in lecture next week. Thanks, guys.